Hi, I'm Jody Schechter, and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi all, Tom Clarkson here, and welcome to your favourite podcast. It's Beyond the Grid, presented by Bose Quiet Comfort 35-2 wireless headphones. My guest this week is a world champion, and not any old world champion, a Ferrari world champion. For 21 years, from 1979 to 2000, he carried the tag of being the team's most recent title winner. I'm talking, of course, about Jody Schechter. Jody beat his teammate Gilles Villeneuve by four points in 79, and that title success was the highlight of his Formula One career, which spanned nine seasons and 112 starts. But the fascinating thing about Jody is that his success didn't end there. His F1 title spurred him on to great heights during retirement. He won the 1981 World Superstars Championship and he then had an incredibly successful business career in America before settling back in the UK to become a farmer. We caught up at Jody's Laverstoke Park farm where, alongside his herd of buffalo, piles of compost and miles of vines, he has a car collection that includes every Grand Prix car he ever raced. He's achieved a lot as Jody. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, Jody, welcome to Beyond the Grid. It's fantastic to have you with us. Now, your life has been one incredible journey. I, I look at it as almost the three stages of Jody Schechter. There was the racing driver, there was the fats firearms operation that you ran in America, and of course now there's Jody Schechter, the farmer. Um, in which part of your life have you been happiest? I don't think I've been happy. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's, fu it's funny. I've got to a stage where I think the priority to, is to enjoy myself, which I've never felt that before. Um, I should have done that 10 years ago. I'm having my midlife crisis too late, but uh, that's, that's what it is. And, of course, it's 40 years this year that you won the world championship for Ferrari. A, a lot has happened in the intervening time, but just how do you reflect on 1979 and A, what happened that year and also the impact the championship had on the rest of your life? Um, I, you know, at the time, I, it was relief. I was trying to become world champion from when I got there the first year. We were third, I think, yeah. And, and then it took me got seven or whatever years to, to become so it was a relief um what what has it done for me in the short term nothing and i went to america to start the company and really went nobody knew that i was who was people in washington when we w went on budgets and stuff they they knew but really i didn't do any race i didn't go to a race for 10 years but I mean, so so the the fame aspect didn't help. But I mean, I guess it set you up financially to go and try all these other businesses. It gave me a base to try start the business in America. I had a partner, but um, we were self funding from three years. Amazing success story. Now we're going to come on to that. But if we can just start by talking about Jody Schechter, the racing driver. Um, what were your strengths and weaknesses? Do you think as a driver? Um, strength, I suppose, car control, um, and I suppose dedication to nothing else mattered but to win. Weakness, um, don't remember things. Probably got involved with the, the, the mechanics of the car too much, which is okay if you had a bad engineer, but when you had a good engineer, you should have been concentrating on and I could, being, uh, being able to drive any, the car anywhere, sideways, whatever it is, can be an advantage when you've got a bad car. But setting up, whatever you do, you just drive around it. So it's very difficult. Where other drivers, Prost and Louder and those times, I think they adjusted the car better than I did. I just drove around problems and the only thing that mattered was the, the stopwatch. And I'm guessing the driving style changed as your career progressed. Well, the tyres were much harder at the beginning, so sliding was an advantage sometimes because you're heating the tyres up quicker. And then they got more and more to the edge where you don't want to, and that became a disadvantage. But I think 
uh, the year I won the championship, I wasn't driving sideways all the time. I was doing it right, I suppose. Doing it right. Now, let, let's just get your thoughts on some of the key rivals that, that were around at the time. First of all, I wanted to ask you about Denny Hull, teammate at McLaren. Impact he had on you, how did he help? Well, they called me the little bear and he the big bear, I suppose, because we were both um, a bit grumpy, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, he, sh he showed me some stuff, not everything at that time, because I was the upstart coming in. But he was a good guy, yeah. Jackie Stewart? Well, Jack, Jack, I mean, Jackie, I met him when I was still in South Africa doing Formula Ford and I'd won the driver to Europe and he spoke to me there. And I remember getting to Brands Hatch and he came and spoke to me and that that for the world champion to come and speak to me was, you know, was really, uh, but then I took his place in the team and um, he worked with some of the stuff. Um, I think Ken wanted me to drive like him and I didn't. You know, I drove more, I suppose I was more aggressive with the car. Um, yeah, but yeah, Jackie, I think probably more about behaving outside the track. Not that I've adapted all of that, thank goodness. What did he say to you when he came and found you when you were a young whippersnapper doing Formula Ford? No, they introduced me, Ford introduced me okay. to him because it was a Formula Ford event and I can't remember what he said really. But is he one of the guys, you say... Have you stayed in touch with him? Have you stay very much in touch with him? We, you know, good friends. Um, yeah. What about Emerson Fittipaldi? Emerson was a lovely guy, really lovely guy, solid guy, fun. Um, yeah. Well, look, the good. guy. There will be some people listening to this who will remember the French Grand Prix of nineteen seventy three. And they will remember perhaps some of the things Emo said after the race, not overly complimentary in your direction, because you had the crash. How did that crash affect your relationship with him? I didn't care really, I suppose, you know. I was an upstart guy and he came to me and, um, and said, and I said, well, if it happened again, I'd do the same. And he walked off. And um, but listen, th th those sorts of things you forget very quickly once you get established and they realize you're not completely mad. Um, I worried about safety very much. Um, well, that 73 season, there are two sort of pivotal moments, I think, that people looking back will reflect on. One was the, the, the crash that you triggered at Silverstone. Yeah. 12 cars taken out. And then there was also the accident involving Francois Severe at Watkins Glen. You were the first car on the scene. Can you talk us through those two incidents and what impact they had on you in sort of rounding you as a driver? Well, you know, you always knew it was dangerous, but really didn't because you're young and you think, uh, you know, you, you've had a shower before you go out, so you're not going to get infected when you crash and stuff like that. Um, the first crash didn't affect me at all. No, I can't remember. I wanted to get into the next spare car and uh, the team manager said, you go and hide <laughs> so <laughs> nobody can see you. And uh, Circus Certes was after me. I, um, but this, what did it feel like to have your peers turn against you like they did after that crash at Silverstone? I don't even remember that. I don't even... Didn't I, care? I, I, I didn't care about that. I was just trying to win races and go as fast as I can. So they could say what they like. It didn't hurt my feelings. As I remember. Mm. Okay, so then we fast forward to the Glen, and what happened with Francois and the impact that had on you? Well, that was a lot different. And, and I saw him go down, and then I came there, and the half of the car was in the middle of the track, and I jumped out because at that time there were still fires around, jumped out. And um, it's quite strange in a way. I remember the battery was still sparking, and the big thing is to get him out of the car. And I went for his safety belt and then turned around and said to everybody else, don't, you know, don't go. I don't remember. Thank goodness I don't remember what I saw. So it, it, it blanked off my mind. But it was, it was a big effect on me because that, it, that when you realize it's real, you know. And I suppose it's the first death that I'd been around and everybody more or less behaved the same. I mean, not, not, not in a negative way, you know, life carried on and you, you thought, well, life shouldn't carry on in a, in a way. You know? mm. 
And, and had you established a relationship with Francois? Because you were going to be his teammate yeah, in 74. Yeah, it was, it was a negative one because I think we crashed in Canada and, uh, and then we had an argument. But I, if I remember before at the Glen, we sort of shook hands and it was, was fine. Yeah. At the Glen, so just before, b- before that, yeah, his yeah. accident. Yeah. I remember, yeah. But did, did his accident then sort of make you... I'm not calm down, that would be the wrong expression, but did it make you think about things a bit more and perhaps drive, you weren't at 10 tenths the whole time, you might be at 9 tenths some of the no, time? No, I don't think it affected me whilst I was in the car at all. You knew that it was dangerous. I think if anybody calmed me down, it was probably Ken Turon. What did he say? How, well, how? He was always um, on top of you and everything, you know. So, be like, you know, as a young guy, he wanted me to be like Jackie, but he was, you know, he was a good... He was a good team manager from a track point of view. Their, their technology was behind. Tyrrell's technology yeah. was behind. So how did Because you- I was McLaren before that, and I felt McLaren was ahead of, uh, when I, ahead of Tyrrell when I went there and saw what they were doing and what they were working on. In what aspect was McLaren uh, the, the big thing I remember was uh, you moved your wing back in those days and it made a big difference. And they hadn't done that and didn't really understand that at that stage, as I remember. So when, when in 1976 the P34 six-wheeler rocked up, what was your initial reaction to that? I just, I just wanted to see what it did. Um, I didn't agree with the theory of it. The theory being? Well, less frontal area and then it'll break better. And the frontal area, well, they put... A, a, a smaller, a lower rear track. And so we went to Ricard and said, well, look, it's faster, but you've got a different rear track, so you, you can't compare it. And then braking, if you want an absolutely flat road, fine. As soon as you turned in, one of the wheels started locking up and um, you had to pull off your brakes. So it didn't, it didn't help in those ways. You could do anything with that car. It was like a short and a long wheelbase in one. So you could put it sideways in the middle of the straight if you wanted to. Um, I mean, it can't have been all bad because you did win in it. Yeah. And, I, and I, when I looked at the results that I did, it, they were much better than I remember because the car broke a lot. Mm. It, was, uh, it, was, it was breaking all the time. I remember going, coming back to England and saying, I can't drive this car like this when it's going to break all the time. Went to um, Zandvoort and I remember all those long bends. If something breaks there, you're gone. Sort of driving like that the whole time. And of course, it was in 76 that you had a wonderful dice with James Hunt at the US Grand Prix. He was going for the championship. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it was a good dice between the two. I think he, he actually ended up <laughs> coming home ahead. But just your thoughts on James and, and the well, whole. Well, well, just it's another thing is that I had a lot of respect for somebody that was going for the championship when I wasn't. And I think there's some young drivers today that don't have respect for anything. And um, I disagree with that. And James, I could have kept James behind me. There's, you know, no question that I, I had a better dice with him at um, Ricard, where he came to me, he said, I've learned a lot because I'd go in the corner fast and slow and back and do it. And they're just so, I had him, you know, uh, over there, but we, we fought a little bit, but I didn't fight to the extent that if he passed me, it was he's going to pass me. I didn't fight that hard because he was going for the championship and I wasn't. Respect for his position in the championship or because he was a friend? Before, be, his, his position in the championship, not because he's a friend. That wouldn't make a difference. Unless it was Jerry, you know. You'd, uh, some drivers, you know they're going to do something stupid. Some yeah. you don't know they're going to yeah. be safe. Some you don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. Well, you mentioned a French driver there. You had Patrick de Paille as your as your teammate yeah. at Tyrrell. Um, from the outside, he looked um, wild. Is that how it was from the inside, or was there a more sort of cerebral side to him? I didn't see him as wild. I saw him as um, so. It's a little crazy in a, in a way, you know. You'd have. I remember the first time we went there, he had some wine at lunchtime. We were practicing in the afternoon. And, wow, that, you know, that's a French way of doing things. Um, he wouldn't do yeah. that at every race, would he? No, no. Oh, no. And, uh, and then he was arrested at uh, one circuit because he was late and he was going on the wrong side of the road. 
he, 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 he sort of, I would say, did more silly things than, than that. A lovely guy. And, and a good racing driver. Yes, yes, yes. So the antithesis of him, if you like, might be someone like Nicky Lauder. Did you have a lot of respect for Nicky at the yeah, time? Yeah, I, I had a lot of respect. L- Nicky was a solid guy. You could drive on the outside of any corner. You, you knew he was um, absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. And then Villeneuve, Gilles Villeneuve, teammate at Ferrari. Well, I mean, Gilles was uh, a lovely guy. Uh, he liked to act like he was crazy. He loved that image. And actually, that's what gave me some comfort because it was a weakness. You know, he would he would go and try and get fastest at every lap. I wanted to win the championship, and that's all I wanted to do. So, um, and he won the first two races, and I was number one driver signed as we know. That that was pressure. I just had to get down and work harder and harder and harder. And um, well, I was lucky enough to win in the end. So he he cultivated this image you're saying of being a bit crazy, and in fact, it wasn't completely true. No, because he was a serious, hardworking. Uh, race driver that you know went on that side very much so we had fun together but um just an example we went to to monza and this is the, the race that i won the championship at and he was doing qualifying tires qualifying tires and in, in the headlines jill quickest breaks record everything like that and i put the hardest tires on and i just worked on setup 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 and i had a better car going into the race and that sort of was the whole way around. I went, got a lift with him once, and I said, in the car, and I said, you're not going to drive like a madman. He didn't. Until we got, I think, a kilometre or two from the factory, then he started wheel spinning and doing donuts and all sorts of things. <laughs> and that sort of summed it up for me. So you, that, that was a journey from Monaco to Maranello. Yeah, because we both lived in Monaco. We're good friends. We had good fun together. He's a solid, honest guy. Mm. Um, if... You want, I'd define him as a bit crazy. Do you think he had a world championship in him? Yes. If he had of not, if he got rid of that image, he could have been world champion. Sure. He could have beaten me if he had, um, if he had wanted to, uh, to, because he he did things like uh, in the middle of the race, he didn't back off his accelerator. And he ran out of petrol because they had calculated in practice. And then Monica, there's a little jump as you go into the straight. Well, he just went, I used to change gears at that time whilst it was in the air. So it didn't grab and he broke a a drive shaft. There was things like that, that, you know. Because you know how you were saying a minute ago, you, you had great car control, perhaps went beyond the limit early in your career. Do you think, I mean, someone said to me, oh, I think, Gilles at that stage was a bit like a young Jody. Is that a fair comparison? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, yeah. I, I, I never saw it like that, but maybe, maybe some people get that mm. comparison. Well, look, just a couple of other things about your career, and we haven't touched on Wolf yet. Um, from the outside, quite an extraordinary decision. What made you go there? I'd done three years with Turrell and knew I had to get out there. It wasn't wasn't anything it just my time was up there and um uh, walter came to me and then i said okay if you get this person and that person, well, peter war was that one of them because he had won the championship with lotus and um and my mechanic came over uh, i'll come with you and um that's what the decision was were you talking to anyone else at the time i can't remember no I can't remember. I remember James saying, oh, that's great, because I won the first race. You did, yeah. Yeah, and, and James said, oh, that's good. That's one out of the way. But then Long Beach, I think I was on the front row or something, should have won that Long Beach. Got a puncher, eight laps to go. I find that, it's, it's, Jody, it's really funny. I mean, I know it's all sort of 40 plus years ago, but I love it where you, you ask me, did I win the first race? And then you go and say, I had a puncher with eight laps to go because you have such a detailed recollection on the of, one hand. Of, it also Of something. I went to uh, <laughs> Surtees. He was, uh, John Surtees was doing a, a thing in London and he was talking about his uh, career. Well, after about three hours, he was still on the motorbikes and I thought, wow. And then um, CNN asked me to come and do a, a commentary at that time. And I said, why? Um, because you won Canada. Oh, did I? <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah. remember that. So you remember some things and you don't. Yeah, but it's just funny. Now I remember nothing, actually. 
which is an advantage sometimes. So, then, so then, Wolf, and then when did you start talking to Ferrari about 79? I went up to Ferrari in, I think, two years before that, three years before that, went up. It was my first visit to, he wanted to see me. And the old man, Enzo, wanted to see yeah, you. Yeah, and that was quite an experience. And um, and then I think I went up one other time, and then the last time they came to me and said, we want to sign you. And that was nearly at the at the beginning of that, so it was 78, was it? Yeah, uh, of that. And I said, no, I want to finish the season or go to the end. They said, no. So I said, okay, we agreed something, and I signed very early. What was he like to negotiate with? Oh, he's, he knew what he was doing. Uh, but the first thing, I always remember that. I went into his office, it was dark, and there's white furniture, like like the 20s, you know, and there was a bodyguard there and everything, and I sat down, you know. And the first question he said, how much money do you want? And first question. First thing he said to me, how much money do you want? And did you give him a number straight back, or did I he said, say, I'll think about it? No, I said, I'm too young to talk about money, which was, a, I think, the right answer, actually. And... Um, yeah, yes. Ferrari was lovely, and you'd, he, he'd invite you every time you came up there into his dining room. As soon as I came up as a driver, he didn't invite me anymore because he loved he loved the fights between drivers and employees. He kept people fighting, you know, to be better. Didn't bother, bother me at all. He um, he's quite like Bernie in that respect, isn't he? Sort of Bernie loved to sort of drop a bomb occasionally just to get people squabbling and maybe maybe Enzo was like that as well. Yeah, people were very scared of him. Yeah. Um, Had you always wanted to drive for Ferrari? Was no, it? no, not really, no. I, I didn't come from South Africa thinking of Ferrari at all. I'm not even sure because where I was, I don't think there were any Ferraris, <laughs> you know. Yeah. My dad had a, an agency for Renault, uh, Alfa. Mm. But um, I can't remember seeing a Ferrari at that time. So had Brabham come knocking on the door at the same time, and if they'd offered you a better package, you would have gone to Brabham, not the lure of Ferrari wasn't that no, strong. I, I, you know, once you had by that time I had done how many years in Formula One, so mm. I knew much more about Ferrari and what it was. Mm. Uh, um, Luca Montezemolo came very early. I think I was getting paid £4,000 from McLaren's and he offered me £60,000 mm. to come and join with Lauda. And I said, no, I've got a contract. Um, so what year was that? That? Boy, that was very early. It was at Ricard, I think I remember it being, but it was very early in my career. You obviously, obviously had you down as a good Ferrari man. I, I, I don't know. I, I yeah. don't really, really. Yeah. yeah. So you win the title in 79. 80 was... I mean, just incredibly difficult season, wasn't it? How diff did you know quite early on in that year that you were going to pack it in and therefore did you struggle with things like motivation? No, no I, I announced that I was going to retire, I think more or less in the middle of the season, maybe a, l a little earlier. Um, I always felt, didn't motivation didn't, I always were motivated. And when I went to a track, I always felt I was pushing as much as I ever pushed. But I always think back, I was, I was more competitive against Gilles or I was, I mean, I think when we got to the championship, we were equal or I was one ahead in qualifying. Um, but in that, that year, he was better than me. And I thought, well, it's, is it when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about understeer, oversteer, there, is that the section that maybe makes you less when you're out there? I don't know. Um, but I was motivated at every race to try and do as good as well as I could do. Why did you want to retire and why didn't you look elsewhere for other opportunities? Um, Renault came to me and said they wanted to, I think there was in, in Canada or, yeah, they came and said, we want you to join us, name your money. And I said, I said no, I've made my decision. And that, um, you know, I, when you get into Formula One, it's like you will do anything for it. You know, you. I remember thinking, going back to East London, my hometown, and thinking, well, I'd rather be dead than not do Formula One, you know, go back there. But and not that I'm trying to be macho about it, but you saw things there that were uh, teams were doing that did not have respect for the drivers' lives. And some of that sparkle came out of it for me. 
And at that stage, one to two drivers were getting killed a year. So I thought, I'm not going to do this for the money. And that was m my decision. I need to get out. Mm -hmm. And I'd retired at 30 years old. Did you ever feel when you were there that Gilles was the chosen one more than you if that's if that, that seems an extraordinary yeah, things to say because you won the championship but everyone talks about the close relationship between Villeneuve and Enzo Ferrari no, I think you're right I think I always think um Enzo had a lot of respect for me and he loved Jill I think if you, if that would mm -hmm. I'd put it that way for sure mm -hmm. okay so you then yeah, he spoke Italian and I didn't why didn't you learn Italian I, I battled to get English right <laughs> Did you speak French living in Monaco? No, no, I did. I did French lessons there, and the only thing I remember is Madame Thibault habite à Monaco. That's what I learned from I don't know how many <laughs> hours of. I'm terrible with language. Okay, so look, you retire at the age of thirty, and um, how much did you miss it? You know, I, I, I first tried to organise a world event with the same cars. And I was uh, talking to Ford and then television and everything. And it didn't happen. That's the first year. So, so, so this is for 1981. You wanted to organize a... a... A world series of a bit like IROC, which is the American thing, but worldwide with people from all over and then try and get television involved. And I spoke to Ford and I spoke to different people, but it never happened. I wasn't good enough to make it happen. Didn't know enough. So that was my first year. And then uh, I think I spent a year more or less helping Jules, uh, his family, should I say, getting getting some of the money. And then I started the company. Sorry, so helping Gilles Villeneuve's family. Yeah, family to get. So Joanne and. and get yeah. money from Ferraris and his sponsors mm. and all that. Mm. So I mm. try to get it as much as I thought was right. That would imply that you and Gilles were very close. Would you say he was the driver you were closest to on the grid? Oh, yeah, definitely at that stage, absolutely. You, you're you always closer to your team and mm. your teammate, uh, whether it's friendly or not. Mm. I and mean, mine were always friendly with my teammates. Then you are with others. I think the French drivers were the only ones that were friendly with each other. Mm -hmm. not, not that we weren't friendly, we, but we weren't. If we go to dinner every night, it's going to be with our team, not with an, mm. another driver. Okay, so, so the World Series didn't happen. But one thing that did happen in 1981 was you won the Superstars. Um, what, do I call it a championship? Superstars championship? But it was... Well, it's a World Superstars. They had, they had the European, um, I think in Israel, uh, came second. And then they had the World, which was the Americans, um, the rest of the world. And um, the Americans had qualifying and everything. And then I won the World Superstars, and and so and you beat what was it? American footballers. You beat Nehemiah and Moses had won his own world record, I think, eight times, and he was a hurdlist. Uh, and Nehemiah was also a hundred meter indoor uh, uh, world champion. Um, yeah, I was very proud of that because racing drivers weren't looked at as athletes, and I used to do a lot of exercise. I, I, I believe I was by far the fittest driver at that time. And then how much did you have to up that training to win the Superstar? Oh, I went to South Africa and did probably six, eight hours a day of exercise. So how, <laughs> how fit were you? I mean, can you, can you tell, what was your 100 metre time, your 800 metre time? How many press-ups could you do? <laughs> well, I was very good at press-ups, actually. I did uh, Bugna with the boxer at that time. And there was a charity event that Jackie wanted me to go to, Jackie Stewart. And I did a push-up with him on my back. So I was, I was strong. I did exercise all the time from when I was much younger um, and did everything. Was I a fast runner? No, I wasn't a fast runner. I was an okay swimmer. But in all, I did enough to win the Superstars, World Superstars Championship. I was very proud of, of that. And has fitness been, did it continue to be a big part of your life yeah. even after that? Yeah. I've always done a lot of exercise. Now I probably do too much, but um, I do every morning. I do at least a half an hour and then I have my steam and an ice cold shower and um, trying to keep young. Even now fit. you're doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very fit for, for, for my age. You look very fit, if I might add. 
I am. I am. <laughs> so tell us how you ended up doing the FATS business, firearms um, training systems we're, in America. Well, how did that in, come about? Yeah. We lived in, a, uh, uh, lived in Monaco and I went to dinner with a guy and he had a magazine or something and there was this system where they were shooting at a screen. And it fascinated me that you're interacting with a movie. And so then I said to the guy, because he had contacts, uh, can I go and see that company because I'm going to export to South Africa or something. I wasn't. I just wanted to look at it. And it was a live round, very unsophisticated. And I thought, what a great concept, but how badly it was done. And then a friend of mine who had businesses in America did a search to see if there was a market for that and came back and said that law enforcement needs that in America. And that's how it sort of started. I went over, started um, basically on the kitchen table. Had you always been interested in firearms or it's quite a random business for a former Formula One driver to set up? I've, I've never been in and, and, and am not interested in firearms at all. Um, so it was just a, you saw it as a business opportunity? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and what helped me very much in, from my Formula One career was developing technology very quickly. And that's helped me for the rest of my life. Because in industry, at that stage, in most of the industry, in a half an hour, I would do what they did in three months. And because of when you get into an hour's practice, you've got um, tires, you've got springs, you've got roll bars, you've got setting, and you've got to make those decisions in that area. And you've got to think very logically and very fast. Um, we went to uh, a company that was had a contract with the, with the US government to make their rifle their, uh, uh, better, much better. And so I put them onto my simulator and we started doing They wanted to use that as part of the, the, the development of it. And at the end of that session, I knew what I wanted to do to get to the next stage. Three months later, this PhD came up with a plan to do, which was similar to what I had done. You know, so, and even in the food business here in, in, in the farm, I developed things very quickly. Mm-hmm. We've won for most of our products, we've won the best prize. Well, we'll come on to Laverstoke in yeah. a second, but just, so how quickly did the fats operation grow in America? I mean, you say you started it on the kitchen table. Yeah, well, I went to a farm and I got the, the fiberglass made and then we went to a, uh, hardware stores and I got things to hold the cameras and I did it that way for a while and um, and then just hired engineers sometimes on consultancy. I got Lockheed, their top guys there. I got to know them and they helped me a little bit there. And once it got going, then it started. The postal department was our first customer. They ordered 10 of our systems. And that sort of, you know, that was the start of it, let's say. And um, because I developed it to a stage where it was a usable system at that time. And was it expensive? How much did it cost? I can't remember at that stage. I think maybe twenty-five or thirty thousand um, dollars. And I wanted it to be like a. I wanted it to last like Formula One. You're lasting two hours or that, and then it may fall apart. I wanted it to last. I remember putting all these rubber things under the computers and everything like this. I wanted to pull it toward the back of a truck and bounce there and then make it work. Because in those days, most computers, if you touch them, didn't work. Mm. Actually, that's today as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, it grows quickly, and then you sell it for yeah. an absolute fortune. Last three years were twenty nine, sixty, a hundred million dollars sales we won the british and the dutch contract one day after another and each of them doubled the size of the company extraordinary so you then who bought it uh, a lazard fund from new york yep. uh, they but there were two of them bidding on it and uh, one won it and um and you sold it when which year i think it was 95 or 96 somewhere around there okay so so you've created a company you've sold it for a lot of money now there I was wasn't some- the only shareholder but there are a lot of people who might have thought, yeah, I might go and um, spend the rest of my life in the Bahamas. But you chose not to do that. The lure of England and, and farming. Where did farming? Well, I always say that I, what else would I have done? I'd gone to Monaco, get a big boat and get fat and into trouble. But actually that sounded really good sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what, so what, the passion for farming, we're sat here in your office at Laverstoke and actually at the bottom of the stairs, there's a photograph of your... 
It says, I think, uh, Jodie's mum, and there's a picture of her with some cattle. So obviously it's, it's farming sort of in, uh, the, in uh, the blood somehow. You no, know, my mother was always very natural food. We didn't have a lot of sweets in the house except for Sundays. And it was fruit, fresh fruit and everything. So I, I was a foodie for natural food, if you want. And I bought uh, 150 acres, three, no, 350 acres and a house when I came back to England. And then I said, okay, I'm going to produce the best tasting, healthiest food for myself and my family. I had a farm in America and just started to look at organics. My wife bought me a book. And so that's how it started as a hobby for the family. And then i got to eat beef for eight weeks if I kill a cow. I'm not going to do that. And I bought the farm next door. Totally ignorant of all of it, of all the food business. I thought, because I, I got to America, I was really smart. I'd do this in 12 years. I can make a brand and do all of these things. But it, it's been very tough, and I've lost a lot of money over the years. Are you now making money here? We, last year was the first year, I think, in 15 years that I didn't put money in, and sometimes some big money. I mean, just... Just tell the listeners a little bit about what you've got going on here, because... Well, well what, what I did is kept what I started, produced the best tasting, healthiest food without a compromise. I, I then started studying soil and went around to lectures all over the world. I then started a, a, a laboratory with a doctor in microbiology, doctor in chemistry. I have a full chemistry lab, um, which has four mass spectrometers, just studying soils. So I wanted to go from the beginning soils right through to the plate and that was i wanted to do it better than anybody else why i don't know why but i mean you say you've got the full chemistry lab i mean my parents-in-law are farmers and is there an argument that you're using a sledgehammer to crack a nut no not at all i think i think the the i was I, I was a natural i wasn't using any chemicals i wanted to do it organically and biodynamically and and much more and so if I wanted to do it from the beginning to the end, I had to look at every single element, like you would in Formula One. Mm. You know, every single element of that car or that process, I had to look at. And how can I improve it from the soils to the grasses, to the animals, to the cooking, to everything? And that's the way I looked at it. And I went all over the world, went to lectures, got 500 books, a lot of them from the beginning of the last century, um, to try and understand everything. A handful of goods... Soil has more living things than people on earth. And that's what makes the sand available to the plant. So people think of sand as mud. It's not. It's very interesting. Good soil. And this is all grade one soil around here, is it? Uh, well, we try and improve our soil. So we use compost and then we do mm. green lays and my, my, my um, grasses have 31 herbs and clothes and grasses in it. So I went in every section of that, I went to try and improve it. And has this, have you applied the same work ethic to, you got some sparkling wine here? Well, if you look around, you can see all the awards we've won for nearly everything. Doesn't mean to say they, they sold. In fact, if I learned anything, is small volume in, doesn't matter how good it is and how much you charge, unless you're doing volume in food, you can't make money. And you can't even make it work unless you're a mom and pop. I went away from mom and pop and then I had, I had 180 people at one time. Working I, here? I, I, yeah, I started sort of five companies at once producing the best tasting healthiest mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. I have an abattoir, I have a charcuterie. We did, um, we did about six cheeses at one stage. I have compost, I have the lab, the farm, um, vineyard. I mean, it just carried on. Completely stupid. <laughs> but I thought I was smart. Where can people buy? I mean, are you selling this internationally? No, we, we, we got our beer into America in all of the Whole Foods, but it didn't really work because you've got to still market it and go and, and give the shops a T-shirt and all that sort of stuff. So we didn't. Um, England, um, Waitrose, Ocado. Mm -hmm. Pret was our biggest customer for the mozzarella. Mm -hmm. uh, fullest pubs we're in 180 pubs exclusive with our buffalo ice cream so um, why buffalo well that was another diversity in what what I needed to produce the best tasting healthiest food it was it was like a, um, I had to get diverse in everything so 
the way I produce the best tasting, healthiest food, follow nature, two main things, slow growing animals and plants are generally healthier and, and taste better. And biodiversity is a key to a healthy natural environment. And we follow that. And that's why I bought the buffalo because I had cows and I had chickens and sheep and all those things and wild boar and all of it. Um, and that was another diversification. And as ended up as one of our only main products, actually. It's an extraordinary place you've got here. And in fact, we've just been, you just, just before we came up here, you drove me around, you've got a new racetrack here. You've got your own Fiorano. Yeah, and then this was because of Carfest. We've run Carfest where they... Um, Which is a charity event here, isn't it? In, for children in need. And uh, they. You know, I met Chris Evans and he, uh, one evening and he said, oh, I've got this sort of event, which is a family event, and I've got like 2,000 inquiries. We had 250 people there. I'd like to do one. I said, well, well you could do it on Laverstoke, and he announced it on Monday morning. And, um, and then so we've done it, I think it's the sixth year now, sixth year, and they went from 15,000, and last two years we went to 28,000 a day. And there was cars all day because Chris was interested in cars and obviously I was. And then in, at the night, uh, go and he gets some of the best bands to play music all night. So it's a fantastic family event. That we used to go down the farm road. And then last, the, last year we went through the compost site, which was difficult. and wasn't, So they said, we want to do a little road around the, to make it into a track. And that's how it all started. And then I've got hold of How much money does it raise? It gets over a million pounds a year that's for fan- children. That is fantastic, charity, isn't it? Yeah. And you wheel out some of your old races? Yes, I normally will two or three of them, um, and then I drive them. So how many of your old cars do you have here? 12 or twelve or 13. And do they all have engines in ready to go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they're supposed to be ready to go, but are they all? They all should be ready to go. Yeah, and your favourite? You know, I, 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 the obvious one is the Ferrari that I won the world championship in. I got that, but um, the the Wolf, the first Wolf, was probably one of my favourite cars to drive. Just yeah, yeah, and I think the team. We had twenty people at that time. Ferraris had two hundred, mm. and you know we were we very easily could have won the championship that year. Mm. How did it make you feel just going back onto a sort of Formula One theme to end? How were you surprised that it took Ferrari 21 years? It was Schumacher in 2000 who won the next driver's title for them. How surprised were you that it took them quite so long? Shows how good I was. No, No, I don't. You know, the teams go through stages. I think they were very competitive and then they had Villeneuve and stuff like that. And and I think Michael should have won it or could have won it, you know, two or three years in a row, I think. But um, in fact, you know, it was... I was more famous when I came back for the last Ferrari world champion than when I was for world champion at the time, really. So it was quite fun when I came back because I hadn't been to a race for 10 years and um, it, was, uh, it was quite good. But people in, in England didn't want to – and I said, I've just been to this company, it's so successful. And, everything. and what about that race you did there? Because they weren't interested in anything but, but past racing. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and do you keep an eye on what's happening in Formula One now? Yeah, from a distance. From I, I haven't been to a race for five years. Um, I watch, you know, television and we have a shoot where I have some of the past and present Formula One team managers, more than, you know, team managers that come. And so I, I keep in contact with, you know, quite a few of them, um, but not deeply involved. What's your take on someone like Lewis Hamilton at the minute? Well, I think he's the best guy around. I think he's doing, he's driving better than he's ever driven. Um, I think he went through a stage a couple of years where um, I think his mind or whatever went into an, another place. But he's definitely the most mature um, driver. He's the best person to win a championship now, mm. I, I think, absolutely. Mm. And Ferrari? Do, do you ever get back to Maranello now? Do you, do they invite ex-drivers back for a for No, a, no, they don't, nice... don't invite them. And um, I haven't been back for as far as I remember. Really? But you'd still, if, if, if Vettel, for example, was to do it this year, would you feel a little bit 
more connected to that success than if anyone else would? No, I, I don't think I've, I'm, you know, I was a Ferrari driver and that's great. Um, but I always look at who deserves it the most. And that's where I'd be, would want to win if you want. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, Joni, it's been such a pleasure to catch up with you. What's next for you in your life? Is there another stage? I've talked about these sure, different sure. stages. On the beach. <laughs> You're going to do it now. Go yeah, I want to drink a lot of whiskey on the beach. <laughs> Jody, thank you very much. Great to chat. Thanks. Given all the success that Jody's had since retiring from Formula One, it's easy to forget just what a brilliant driver he was. After his wild early years, he developed into a real thinking man's racing driver, and he executed that 79 season to perfection. You can tell too that he was very close to Villeneuve, and I think they had a lot of fun during their two years together at Ferrari. Thanks for your time, Jody. It was great to catch up. Well, that's it for this week, but we'll be back in just seven sleeps with another superstar guest from the world of F1. While you're waiting for that to drop, why not subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favourite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thank you for your kind messages about last week's show with Nico Hulkenberg. There's a lot of love for the Hulk out there, not least from Prajwal Pratap, who says, absolutely loved the Beyond the Grid episode with Nico Hulkenberg. He's so humble and has such a grounded perspective towards his career. It's a matter of when, not if, he'll get his first podium and a championship. Just become a new fan of the Hulk. Couldn't agree more, Prajwal. The Hulk is a great guy, and who knows, if he gets that first podium, it might just open the sluice gates to many more. Please keep your feedback coming. We really love it. And remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. And you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.